what code ports of the computer? I have no idea. Let's see. Okay, we will. Okay, we're recording. Great job. Yay, wonderful. All right. <laughs> Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of Let's Clear the Air. I am your host, National Field Director for Moms Clean Air Force, Heather McTier Tony, and so excited that I have joining with me today, Catherine Flowers, who is our uh, field organizer in Houston, Texas. Welcome, uh, Catherine. Thank you for joining us today. No, thank you for having Texas represented. Hey, hey, we're excited. Well, normally I have, so I always have tea and I always have a mug and I realized I do not have a Texas mug. So I'm sure, and I don't know how that happened, right? Because I've been back and forth in Houston. I don't know how. I will get one. I will make sure you have one. <laughs> I'm sure I will get a Houston mug um, so I can represent Texas. So today I'm drinking from my Run Oxford mug. I, I'm a... Mm the Run Oxford community here, and I thought it was a fitting um, mug for today uh, to not only honor running, but also the life of Ahmaud Aubrey. Uh, moms in our universe of Moms Clean Air Force uh, joined in the run on this past Friday before Mother's Day uh, to run 2.23 miles for Ahmaud, and, and I ran, and uh, my family ran, so I figured this would be a perfect, perfect mug for today. How are you doing, Catherine? Good, good. And, you know, just to add to what you're saying, um, I ran too with my family. Uh, and I, Ahmad could have been my son. Yeah. My yeah. sons go out and run all the time. And so, yeah, definitely want to send light and love to his family and to all who are in the fight to make sure that justice is served. Absolutely, absolutely. I feel the same way. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, our sons and college students a little later on. Uh, for all of you all who are joining us, thank you. We normally do this live, however, with technology, and I think there are just a bunch of people online today. We had some technical challenges, but that's okay. We're still coming to you. We want to make sure that we share with you what was going on in Moms Clean Air Force this week, what you uh, can look forward to, and, and like we said, let's clear the air and just talk about some things. So I want to give you some updates on some projects that we've been talking about here at Moms Clean Air Force. First, we have our Wheeler Must Go campaign. Thank you all for signing that uh, petition. And if you have not, please go to momscleanairforce.org. It's one of the top line things to sign a petition asking Andrew Wheeler to go. Now more than ever, we see that even in the midst of a global pandemic, EPA is still trying to push through um, regulations and rollbacks, rollbacks to regulations that we know that are very protective of our children and our environment. And this is all coming from Andrew Willard. It's, it's not the, the good people that um, are at EPA. This is all the, the agenda of the coal lobbyists. And so uh, as of today, over 5,000 of you have signed our petition. We are so thankful for you. It also means we have sent over 18,000 notes to members of Congress, all thanks to you. And we know that you have some more friends and family members that are out there that um, could also sign this petition. So please don't hesitate, rush to the website, and make sure that you sign it today. Also, uh, next week is the EPA hearing on the PM 2.5 standard. And we're going to get into that a little bit around what's going on in, in Texas. But uh, we are encouraging folks to sign up to testify at that hearing. Now, um, this is a really unique opportunity because we are uh, at home. There's now a chance for us to participate in the hearing right from the comfort of our own homes. So you don't have to fly anywhere. You don't have to be in DC or wherever the hearing may have been held. You can sign up online. Uh, you can be ready to provide your testimony next week on the, either the 20th or the 21st. And the links to that are also on our website at Moms Clean Air Force. So lots to do. Plenty of action that's going on. And uh, even though we are in the middle of COVIDing, we still have got an obligation to make sure that we're protecting our children from the impacts of air pollution and climate change. Which brings us to Texas. Ah, 
Catherine, now, you know, we have talked about Texas um, and air pollution in Texas um, and the need for air monitors in Texas. I know that is a lot of the work that you're doing there on the ground. So first, thank you for being an advocate for children and health and well-being for all citizens in the Houston uh, area. But tell us a little bit what's about what's happening right now and comments I understand for uh, PM 2.5 there in Texas. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, you know, everything's big in Texas. What's ironic, uh, the Moms Clean Air Force team was able to do their retreat here. And so they got a chance to really get a frame of reference on the large scale, uh, our landmass in uh, Houston and throughout Texas. Um, and so, yeah, we just have some challenges. In addition to that, Houston really is the model for the rest of the nation. And so if we can't get it done in Houston, it can't get done anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there is an EPA hearing on a, in addition to the Texas Commission on Environment Quality also has a hearing and it's not too late to sign up for that. You have until Thursday to uh, either sign a petition that the One Breath campaign has put together or to make some testimony yourself. Um, but the truth is uh, PM 2.5 or soot is deadly. Um, COVID has given us an opportunity to really see what an invisible crisis could look like. But in Houston, 5,000 people die every year because of PM 2.5. Wow. That, that is an extraordinary number. Yeah. Um, and what's more extraordinary is how it really affects our children. We take for granted that as children are developing and we encourage them to be outside, breathing in this micro, this particle, right, that you can't even see. Think about your hair, like the tip of your hair. It's smaller than that. And so although our noses are designed to be filters, it can't filter the really tiny things. And mm -hmm. so children are being affected. Like we often think asthma is natural. That is not natural. Yes, yes, yes. We have been fooled into thinking that some things are just supposed, you know, they just sort of happen to people. No. There's a statistic. So, you know, you just sort of happen to get this. And right. you're right, PM 2.5 or soot, it is, right. we, we can use the statistics and numbers and they're all kinds of acronyms. Let's just call it what it is. So soot. Right. It's into our lungs and it has to do with where we live. And it's asthma. Um, it's been shown to um, be one of the contributing factors to heart disease, uh, any type of respiratory issues, it exasperates. And so, you know, I think about the fact, Catherine, that we're talking about these issues and you're right, 5,000 5, people a year. First of all, five people a year is too many. Right. 5,000 people a year, a year. And on top of that, we're dealing right now with COVID, another respiratory issue. So it just seems like compounding these things um, in, in areas like Houston, where you do have such prevalent air pollution. Yeah, and you know what's interesting as well? Hmm. That PM 2.5 is an equal opportunity offender, right? right? We often talk about, you know, our, the disparities between our low to moderate income communities and regular communities. But in Houston, PM 2.5, so 12 micrograms is mm -hmm. what the standard is right now with EPA. Mm -hmm. Across the city, whether you live in River Oaks or in Montrose or uh, the Heights, the number is above 12 milligrams, micrograms. Wow. So it is true. So, and, and I'm glad you raised that point because you're right. You know, sometimes we, we tend to think of these things as only hitting one part of a, only one part of the community, when in reality, it impacts everybody. I heard something and I want you to tell me if it's true or not, or just sort of help us clear the air about what mm -hmm. reality is. So I, I was reading something and it said, um, one, that air pollution and there, there's still, uh, there was still a number of really high levels, even in the midst of a closure, even in the midst of stay-at-home order. Like Houston had still had, what, 15 to 20 days where they exceeded the allowable amount of, um, of, of the 
foot in the air, even when everybody was at home. And then I read something else that said that since people are starting to now come out of their houses and get back to um, go back to work and do a little bit more traveling, like the air pollution is coming back even more. Can you talk about that or tell us a little bit about that? What's going on from what you're seeing there on the ground? Yeah, so, you know, Houston has one of the largest highway systems in the nation. And so when we talk about vehicle use, it's whether we're at, you know, at the stay, stay at home orders are just people coming through Houston, right? There's mm -hmm. I-10 runs through Houston, 90 runs through Houston. There's all these highway systems that run through our area. And so that contributes to uh, air pollution. Um, and so in addition to that, we have uh, concrete batch plants or we have all of these, we have no zoning. Houston has mm. no zoning. So now, I don't think a lot of our members across the country realize that, like there's no zoning at all in Houston, Texas. So you can have an amazing neighborhood um, like Glenwood, or I can think of so many amazing neighborhoods where, you know, there are white picket fences and big houses and landscape yards, and you go around the corner and there's a chemical plant or a small cement company, or you have um, places where they dump sand and dirt and yeah. So no zoning contributes to the amount of pollution that are, that's reaching people when it traditionally wouldn't for other cities because mm. they, they put those things in um, concentrated areas, but mm. not in Houston. Uh, mm. we, uh, we're making sure that, uh, not intentionally, I'm sure they had a plan for this, but yeah. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to say the rhyme or reason, but yeah, no zoning. So remember, right. no zoning in Houston. We have the largest highway system. And then we have chemical plants. We're still mm. the energy capital of the world. And wow. so layering all of that and compounding all the things that could potentially be in the air, there's no, it, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that we have more than 5,000 premature deaths every year. Right, we, we right. We have to be more intentional. And so like with the EPA, again, right now, the EPA standard, they're supposed to uh, be responsible set for setting quality air standards and monitoring networks, but 12 milligram is what the standard is right now across Houston, it's higher than 12 micrograms. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have to do better. What, what are we doing? What, what do we do? You know, that's the question that it, it comes to. Uh, and Houston is one of the epicenters of a country in terms of culture, activity, food, you know, all of these different things that come together and make Houston the beautiful, um, just, I think, picture of, of what the American fabric really is. And we can think of a number of big names that come out of Houston, to be honest. You know, what, what, <laughs> we can think of a ton when we talk about Houston's medical um, community and all the great things. How do we raise awareness? I mean, like, what is it going to take um, for people to recognize that all of this greatness is being killed off every single day by the stuff that we breathe? Yeah, it's no small feat. Uh, like, you know, our word, we love to say everything's big in Texas. Uh, but the truth is diversity is our strength. And that the people who live here are, is what's most valuable. And so it's really engaging people and meeting them where they are. As the most diverse city in the nation, you know, we speak more than 100, there's more than 100 consulates here. And so mm -hmm. that means that there are some language barriers, but also again, providing them information in a way that they can receive it. And that's one of the great things about our campaign, about One Breath, is that we have visual materials that make it very clear, right? You don't even have to read all the way through before you say, oh my gosh, this is a problem. When you see people having um, you know, breathing issues. And what's interesting, you know, COVID has required us to wear masks and to be careful. But the truth mm -hmm. is, it's actually a benefit because PM 2.5 or soot 
is something that we would have needed to um, prevent from taking in because yeah. we didn't see it as a crisis. And so organizations like TSU have were had actually created masks before now, and they were selling them. So they had PM 2.5 masks, uh, but how do we get people to get involved? Again, I think COVID, although I don't want to say it was a good thing, COVID has really educated us about how we can fix things now. Mm. And I think it has given us a sense of urgency, a, new, a renewed sense of urgencies that some things we just can't wait on. Yeah. Uh, and people have seen the inequities uh, and that people of color, people who live in poor neighborhoods, are experiencing more damage than any other community. And so those communities now are empowered to say, hey, what about us? And what do we need to do? And so getting them to sign up and to make testimony has been very easy. And so we want to encourage everyone that's listening and watching that this is an ongoing campaign. It doesn't stop here. Mm -hmm. It's about getting involved at the moment that you learn it. Um, and, and taking a stand. Absolutely. The, um, you know, you mentioned COVID and, and I just wrote a piece last week called COVIDing While Black. Uh, if you're, mm -hmm. if please look for it. It's on our website. It was published by Dame Magazine and it's online. You can find it on the Moms Clean Air Force website. And, and in there, you know, one of the things that I was talking about were the, was the fact that we have to deal with COVID amongst all the other issues that the African American community is burdened with, including environmental justice, including economic disparity, and including the failures really of our government, uh, the administration, and even media to, to some extent to show us, you know, ourselves when we're talking about you need to social distance, you need to stay at home. Um, how do you do that? You know, how do you social distance and stay at home and try to stay safe when the place that you need to stay safe is surrounded by air pollution? You've got indoor air quality issues. Like you're you're in trouble if you go outside. You're in trouble if you stay in the house. What are we supposed to do? And to add to that, that black and brown people are often the essential workers that have to go out. Uh, to see some of the targeting that's been done across the country, it's, 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 it's devastating, you know, to the community, but people have to remember what was done as we, you know, make sure that our friends and family are registered to vote. Right. And we're putting people in position that have the best interest of communities, particularly um, uh, vulnerable populations. I think it's so important that we do that. And I appreciate you for raising that. Talk to us a little bit about One Breath, because you've mentioned it a couple of times. And for our members who are in the Texas area, as well as the rest of the country, tell us about you know, what One Breath is, that partnership, and how they can get involved. Yeah, so you know, collaboration is key. You, know, you asked a question, how do we get people involved? And it's collaborating. And so One Breath is a campaign created by the Environmental Defense Fund um, to provide accurate information and tools for your toolkit. And so we're involved, it's a partnership with Rice University and um, Air Alliance and some other folks and EDF. And it's again, making sure that people have the information that they need to make the best decisions for their families. And so it's about putting tools in people's toolkit. Great, and so the, the petition is with one breath. We want people to, um, share and sign that petition. And from my understanding of this is to ensure that we are um, looking to put air monitors and supporting air monitors in all parts of Houston. Um, right. As the air, we're, we're, we're really seeing how this is traveling across the, the city. Right, it's about adding more monitors, especially mm -hmm. in West Houston. So West Houston traditionally isn't a, a, a focus point. It's high-end area that's where the shopping malls are located um, and so we don't think about there being a need or that uh, or think about there being pollution but again mm -hmm. bm 2.5 or soot is an invisible crisis and yeah. it, there are no monitors in that area but in the area it is exceeding the 12 micrograms uh, that is the epa standard and so we're making sure that we're holding the Texas Commission, Environmental uh, Quality uh, Commission to uh, 
give us some monitors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is what is the city doing? <laughs> Sounds like we need to work on the city. <laughs> and you know, we've been working with the city on the climate action plan. It's funny you say that because last night, the Houston Climate Movement, uh, we had a meeting and that was something that I uh, urged us to really focus on. We take mm -hmm. for granted that the city of Houston, their buildings alone create more admissions than any other uh, vehicle in Houston. And so, yes, it should be included that they will help address some of these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are asking the mayor to consider including some measures in the climate action plan. Uh, the city also has a resiliency plan. And so we want to make sure that in the resiliency plan that we put in SMART goals. It's not good enough to just say we're going to address it. It has to be said that, you know, we will fund this many monitors or we will do this. And so, yeah, we want to make sure that they are making some clear actions. Great, great. Well, Catherine, we are certainly glad that we have you on the ground there in Houston for our Moms Clean Air Force con uh, members to connect to locally. Um, the, you all can reach out to Catherine. I know you can get her through our website at momscleanairforce.org. And when you go to states, you can look up Texas and you'll see Catherine's bright smiling face right there. Or you can always reach out to us online via Twitter and Facebook. Catherine, you, um, have the Moms Clean Air Force Texas page on Facebook and there's Moms Clean Air Force Texas at uh, Twitter as well as One Breath Partnership um, there on both of those spaces as well. So thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Now tell us about your, your kids. I know you have three amazing college students right now. What are they doing? <laughs> for asking. You don't get a chance to really brag about them. And, and I am so proud of them. They have been resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like every year we're tested. It was Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Harvey um, or the Hornet killer bee. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, everything. I know, it's some of everything, but I am so proud to announce that my daughter actually is graduating from Tulane next week. Uh, she was accepted into a, conser a conservatory. She's a theater major, philosophy major. And so out of the thousands of people that applied for this conservatory, they chose 12 people. And my daughter is one of them. So one day you will see her on Broadway. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> and then I'm also so, so proud of my youngest son. He's an architect major at Tulane. Uh, he is in his fourth year of a fifth year program. And so um, I love that he's also passionate about the environment and trying to figure out how do we create things that are green and healthy for communities. And so the world will have um, an architect soon who uh, is focusing on making sure that our communities uh, get what it is that they need so that they can be uh, safe and healthy. And my oldest son, who is a project manager and also very um, passionate about serving, he's making sure that people are receiving food uh, during this COVID experience. Um, he's actually still working on projects where they are rebuilding houses mm. from um, Harvey. And so people forget, you know, that our communities have to be more than resilient. They have to be super people yeah. because, you know, it, when one thing doesn't take us out, it makes us stronger. Yeah. And so together we are better. And so I'm so excited for my family as we continue to be resilient um, and continue to serve and continue to want things to be better for everybody. Yes, I love it. I love it. So proud of them. Please send them our love and gratitude for all the work that they are doing, even in the midst of this crisis. And, and thank you for everything you're doing there in Texas. And thank you, all of our Moms Clean Air Force members from all over the country. Thank you so much for continuing the fight 
and uh, even you know in the midst of COVID, doing the things that we need to do, whether it's being on the front lines in hospitals and nursing homes, or grocery stores and hotels that are reopening, or being uh, at home and managing your kids that are are now um, at, at doing at home school, whatever it is you're doing from whatever space that you're doing it in, know that we support you, we appreciate you, and we're here to encourage you. Thanks for tuning in. Next week, be sure to tune in and join us. We'll be talking about why it is so important for you to complete that census information if you want to ensure that you have clean air in your community. Don't miss it. We can see you then. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.